praise God. So our whole focus is upon uh, Jesus. And uh, this shouldn't be just a cliche, you know. This should be something that we are very conscious about. The problem with our situation is always that we focus a lot on ourselves. So we put a lot of emphasis on ourselves. Yeah. So that is called a soulish person. And like, uh, you know, some people ask, you know, how can I avoid uh, being very sensitive? Like when people say something bad about me or people criticize me. Now, I can give you the secret here and that is uh, you have to die to yourself. <laughs> uh, that's why when you go to the graveyard and you scold the people at, at the graveyard, they are not going to jump out and respond. All right? Nobody is going to jump out and say, why you scold me? And then you can stand there and praise the person. The person is not going to come up and say, thank you, because the person is dead. So you have your struggle is because why? Because you are not dead. Uh, you know yourself. Uh, thank you, huh? And then you're you, not, you. you not alive to, you're not alive to, uh, <laughs> you're not alive to Christ. Uh, just now I heard some thank you, thank you. <laughs> Praise God. Means thank you for uh, wanting to die to yourself. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now, this is a very difficult uh, chore, you know, because when Jesus said that you shall take up your cross, daily you know you deny yourself daily wow the reason why daily is because we always every morning we got up and then we become alive again then we sit on our throne again then we get very sensitive again then people say something then we uh in malaysia we will say you know <laughs> and then uh <laughs> we cannot eat, we cannot sleep because somebody says something bad about us. But you don't have to go through that. You really don't have to go through that because you learn the secret of the word of God. Right? You die to yourself, you become alive to Christ and anybody say bad thing about you, no issue because the definition of your life doesn't depend upon these people. These people are not your gods. These people are not going to change your life. If they got money, they are not going to give to you, right? If, if, if they have any good thing, if they criticize you, they are not going to come and bless you. The only person who is real, you know, every moment going to bless you is Jesus Christ, your creator God. He is the one who loves you so much. And then you focus a lot of, of attention on people who do not love you, and then you get all vexed up and they're all frustrated. Why? You know, sometimes I, I, I can be pretty harsh. You know, I say that, why don't you move from the zone of stupidity to the zone of wisdom? God gave you the zone of wisdom. And why are you struggling with all this? You don't have to. All right. Because these people, they don't create you. They are not your creator. So don't let the world define you. Let Jesus Christ, let God define you. I tell you, when you are in love with Jesus, a lot of wonderful things happen to your life. You, you know, you smile better, you laugh better, you know, and then uh, for all of you ladies, uh, you've got less wrinkle, you know. Yeah, so that you don't have to go for plastic surgery to help you, <laughs> all right? So this morning, uh, we want to share about, we want to learn about Ten Commandments, uh, praying through the Ten Commandments. But let me first uh, explain to some of you who may, may not uh, know about uh, what we have been going through. Uh, if you look at some of our past videos, we have been talking about uh, the soulish self and the spiritual self. Uh, soulish self will be the self that you are king or you are queen and you decide to take control of your life. And so every time when you encounter people, you are always like reading, uh, reading in between the line about what people say, you know, and then you are affected by their mood. You are affected by their nonverbal uh, expression. 
Uh, so all these are your soulish self. You always compare, you compete, you know, and uh, a lot of stress, a lot of stress. Yeah. And the Lord says that, you know, you should surrender all this to me because you, the soulish self, okay, let me put it this way. The soulish self is the false self, is the fake self, is not the real self. Because that this is a self that is created by you not created by God. See, the spiritual self is the one created by God. But many of us, we reject God in our heart. We reject God. Outside, we say, oh, we go to church, we are Christian, or we love Jesus. But honestly, inside our heart, we sit on our throne, we reject the recommendation of God, and we accept what we think about ourselves. That's why you struggle. That's why I got so much stress. I, you know, so many years, you know, this habit, this old habit of, you know, you know, defining yourself, you know, and then get into all this kind of a problem that you don't have to. Some of you actually, you even have migraine headache. You got, you know, ulcer in your stomach. You got stress, you know, all over your neck here. And every day you wake up with this stress. Why? right? You don't have to do this. Right? God give you a way out. God say that I want you to be the person that I've created you to be. I don't want you to be the person that you create yourself to be. So please, can you let me be your God? And that's what God is telling you. So how do you do, do this? We, we have one we call handover prayer, right? Remember the handover prayer? which means that you relax. you got nothing else that you can do. You hand over. So you got this thought, you know, I, uh, that Mary uh, thought bad about me. Uh, I'm so angry. I'm so angry. Uh. You hand over to God. Lord, you know, I'm so angry with Mary because she thought bad about me. You hand over. Now I hand this over to you because, Lord, I can't handle this. I hand over to you. And let go. Let go. And then the, the Lord will whisper in your heart and say, Thank you. I'm going to take care of this. And Mary is no longer your concern. I will take care of her. All right. And I also want to take care of you. And you be totally relaxed. And that's it. You hand over. Then you got something like of concern. Maybe uh, your, your, your daughter is in school and you don't know what happened to her. And then you say, Lord, I commit my daughter to you. <coughs> All right. Or even if I have this cough and I'm concerned about this, this cough, and I say, Lord, I commit this cough unto you. Right? And you just hand over because the Lord is right there with you. Okay? Now, after you learn handover prayer, you will find that you have moved from the soulish self to depend upon God. And then you find uh, spiritual self is not so much hard work. It's more like surrendering, surrendering, surrendering. Then in the morning, you wake up and then you take over again. Then you surrender again, all right? And this is the kind of a prayer that you can do it for 24 hours. I've been doing it, you know, whether you are cleaning the house or whether you are uh, bathing the dogs, <laughs> like what I did, or whether you are hanging up the laundry, you know, or whether, uh, let's say you're doing work at the, at the moment at, a, you know, you, you, you pause to rest for a moment and then there is certain concern. Immediately you hand over. Or you are working with certain clients and certain clients or customers have been very difficult. Instead of getting all stressed up, hand over. Hand over. Or you are driving. You are driving. Some of you are very stressful when you drive. Huh? And then you start to show your sign language, you know, your, your hand. And then you start to score all the motorists, you know, this one idiot, that one stupid, and all that, you know. Uh, instead of doing that, hand over. Hand over. If really somebody misbehave on the road, you know, no need to stress up and say, Lord, I hand over this motorist to you. I hand over this guy to you. Lord, I just hand over. Look, Lord, that motorcyclist, you know, cut right into my path. I hand over to him. Keep him safe, Lord, you know. So you're blessing people. You're blessing people. And you know what that, that will do to you? I tell you, the connection with God will be immediate because you're connecting with God all the time. 
and your spiritual self will find fulfillment. And I can tell you, you will be so relaxed and the peace of Jesus come upon you. You will be the happiest Christian. Sometimes sad to say, I have seen Christian, I've been a pastor for 30 years. I've seen Christian, I, you're so sad, you know, they look like they've been hit by the truck and you know, hit by the aeroplane and hit by the train also. You know, it's like, I, your Jinja Cham. No need, just hand over, okay? And today we are going to teach you how to do, uh, means that you, after you have done handover, then some in, in your prayer time, in, in your specific prayer time that you want to pray uh, to the Lord, then what you are going to do is that you're going to learn how to pray through the Ten Commandments, okay? So this is very, very interesting. And this is not, uh, of course, it's not created by me. It's actually created by um, uh, this uh, Martin Luther, the reformer. Okay, the father of the Reformation, right? So you can see this is that sculpture of him, Martin Luther. Now, don't confuse Martin Luther King. Eh? Martin Luther King is an activist in America. This Martin Luther is a German monk. And later on, he became uh, what we know as the Protestant. Okay, he protests against the Catholic Church. And then uh, you find that uh, this is the style that he prays. So he prayed through the Ten Commandments. And so it is good for us to learn because, uh, of course, uh, I can teach you how to pray through the Lord's Prayer too. But uh, for today, we learn how to pray through the Ten Commandments. Yeah. So the first thing Martin Luther tells us to do is to free ourselves from distraction. Of course, during his time, there's no handphone. But for us now, we have handphone, we have the TV, we have the laptop, and then we have the iPad, you know, and we have all kinds of uh, things that will interrupt us. And so we must take time out of our busy schedule, all right, and turning off all the noise of the technology around us, which means that you really got to hide your handphone away. You you cannot pray when your handphone is right there and then suddenly it starts to blink, even though you milk it, but when it starts to blink because there's a notification or there's a call that's coming in, you know what's going to happen? You're going to be very, very uh, distracted and then sometimes be stressed up also, right? Now, uh, for Martin Luther, he has four parts uh, to every uh, prayer over the commandment. Uh, but you, you, can, you, you can do this on your own but I'm just going to give you a simple prayer for every uh, commandment, all right? So uh, his style is this way. For example, when, when commandment number one, right? He said there's only one God. Then he will ponder what God intends us to do with this idea of knowing that one God, all right? So he say, okay, which means that God doesn't want us to worship any other God. God doesn't want us to acknowledge any other people or any other uh, item or object to be God. There's only one God, right? Then uh, Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. So from instruction, we go straight to Thanksgiving, whereby Martin Luther, he started to praise God for his goodness revealed through the commandment. It means that, Lord, thank you so much for being my God. Thank you so much for being that one great God, the creator God, you see? So that's thanksgiving. And then confession. You know, this is acknowledging our sin. Why you confess is because, you, you know, sometimes you take the place of God. Even though you say there's one God, but sometimes you want to be part-time God. And many of us are having a lot of problem because we are part-time God. And sometimes it's this way. We are full-time God, but God is part-time God. So full-time we are in charge. Okay. And then we struggle, and then we went through a lot of tough time. And why are we doing this? Because oh, we don't acknowledge him as God, you see? So that's why I confess, I say, Lord Jesus, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. So often I become part-time God. So sorry, Lord, that I depended upon myself. I never asked you to help me. I never talked to you. I just do my own thing. I'm self-willed. All right, 
and then you are God, and I actually sin against you. All right. So all these are confessions of sin. <coughs> now this is not called sin consciousness. Now, some of you have been so affected, say sin consciousness. This is not called sin consciousness. This is called conviction of the Holy Spirit. All right. And that when, when some people say the Holy Spirit no longer convict you of sin, don't even uh, believe that. Because what the Holy Spirit does is that he's a comforter when he comes and and uh, all right, when, when, when you are being saved, okay, when you are being saved, you are already justified, which means that that's Christ and Christ alone. That's his work. Uh, that's the finished work of Christ so that you will go to heaven. But then now you come to sanctification. Sanctification means that God loves you for who you were, but he wants to change you. He's not happy with who you were. All right. He loved you, but he wants to change you to become like the image of his son. And therefore, that's called sanctification. And so sanctification is a process. You are not immediately sanctified. Some of you, you know, you still use vulgar language. You still have dirty thoughts. You know, you still hate people. Though you say, Pastor, I don't hate people. You know, I just don't like them. Yeah, that's called hate, lah, you know. And then you still criticize people. You still judge people. You still curse people. And then when people offend you, you get so, you know, angry and then until a point that you cannot sleep cannot eat you say all this are what are all this this is because of your uh this human nature which is called the soulish self which is always the okay. and so what is transformation uh transformation means that from the soulish self you're going to become the spiritual self but that takes time that takes sanctification so uh give yourself time and 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 be kind to yourself like you know take small steps yeah don't, don't expect to be just changed, you know, overnight. But you are going to take steps. Like uh, me, you know, for, for many years, I was a man of great anger, great temper, right? But God has been merciful and then slowly, slowly changing me. You know, it took so many years. Now I'm 66 years old. And I'm not saying I've reached yet, but I think when I, mean, I look back at 36, I'm much better, now, you know, or look back at 26, and look back at 16, I, I'm much better now than before because of the transformation. So Christianity is not about, you know, which club you belong to, which church you belong to. Christianity is about transformation. So that's called sanctification. But if you think that you're already sanctified, then you don't no need to transform, no need to change. So you always behave like that. And, you know, then you, uh, you just tell people, I'm like that one then which means that Christ is not doing that work in you, okay? So this confession is important. And then prayer. Uh, prayer is to ask God to help, uh, you know, God to help us so that we can obey him. So back again, the instruction means that you, you, you ponder what instruction that, uh, you know, that verse or that uh, commandment is for me. Okay, what should I recognize? What should I learn? And then the other one is to give thanks, you know, give thanks for the privilege of having this one God, yeah, or for the privilege of doing various things as the commandment would teach you. And then it's confession. Confession is to acknowledge what I've done wrong or what, I, what mistake I've made and this is good. And then after that, prayer is to ask God to help us to obey him. So, the practical application, number one, according to Martin Luther, is that first while praying to the Ten Commandments, you will learn about the sin that you may have committed. Yeah, Because commandments is to tell you which area would be correct and which area would be wrong. All right, And, and how you should behave. And also, not just a behavioral change, but that there's a transformation of the spirit. That your spirit is in line with the Spirit of God, yeah? So uh, by praying through the Ten Commandments, you will start to make adjustment. And then through this handing over prayer, and we talk about, you will hand over this area of your life that may not be pleasing to God, okay? So you hand over, hand over. <coughs> and then 
when you pray through the Ten Commandments, you become aware that God is holy and requires perfect righteousness, which you don't have and I don't have. Now, who has this righteousness? Jesus. All right? And so, when I surrender my weakness to Him, He grant unto me strength. When I surrender my sin to Him, He give me His righteousness. You see the point here? And that's why this is uh, an act of surrendering. And you will realize the importance of God's grace and mercy because you start to receive grace and mercy, which I receive a lot, a lot of grace and mercy. And then after receiving grace and mercy, what must you do? You must learn to give grace and mercy to others. So how do I know whether you are under grace or not? I see your behavior. I see your act of kindness. I see your act of graciousness. You know, you are very magnanimous. You are very gracious. Yeah. So I see all that. Then I know that you are under grace. But if I see you are judging people, you are gossiping against people, you are criticizing people, you know, everybody is bad, and you're always bringing out the flaws of people. You are seeing the speck in the eye of your brothers, your sisters. Then I know that you are still under judgment. You are not under the grace of God. Because you are not experiencing grace. You are still under law. You are still under judgment. You are judging everybody. So this is how you evaluate yourself. I use this to evaluate myself. Too. You see, most of uh, us is that we evaluate ourselves with the heart, but you, we evaluate others with the head. And that's why a lot of stress. And we always say, ah, oh, this, this person, that person. You see, practical Christianity will tell you we actually evaluate ourselves with the head, means that we are harsh on ourselves. Okay? And then we evaluate others with the heart, the heart of Jesus. And then we, we give them leeways, we give them a lot of challenges, you know, and that we don't judge them. Uh, yes, there might be some people who criticize you and really gossip against you and really run down your character. You know, what the Bible says is what bless those who curse you, all right? And pray for those who persecute you. Why? Because you are in the spiritual. You are a spiritual person. But of course, if you are a carnal person, you know, you are a soulish person, then you fight back, you know, you it's the soulish fighting against the soulish, and that's why you find in the church there's a conflict, you know, two soulish person come, you know. So, is there really conversion? There's no because conversion means what? Transformation. There's no transformation. So for many years in the same church, fighting, fighting, quarreling, quarreling. You know. Why? It's because I am number one. You hurt me. Huh? You offend me. Huh? You, you know, things like that. Okay? So let the grace of God come forth. Let the grace of God come forth. Then application number three says, in your prayer, your heart will be filled with gratitude. And you want to spend time in giving thanks and praising God. So uh, something happened when you start to pray. Your heart will be softened. All right. All the sin uh, that that you know that surround the, your conscience will be torn off. You know, all this hard crust, you know, this covering over your conscience will be torn off, torn off, torn. Then your heart will become very tender and full of love. And then it's so easy to love God. Then you find that your prayer will not be prayer of complaint. I don't think I've prayed any prayer of complaint for the last so many years. I don't even remember a single prayer of complaint to God at all. Even when somebody, you know, would do something against me or something like that. And I am not stupid, right? And I, and I know it. Ah, okay. That person is coming against me. That person is saying something against me. But I, how do I respond? I can respond with the soul itself and then I'm going to cause the person to suffer and things like that. You know, give the person the cold war or, you know, cut the person off and then be very harsh with the person. Or I can move in the spirit and begin to love the person as Christ loved. 
and began to forgive the person. All right. Now, how can all these things happen? It's because when you're you're praying and you're walking with the Lord over here, your heart becomes tender. That's why there's no no need prayer or complaint, Lord, you know. But rather that you begin to give thanks and say, I I thank you for my brother, and I pray for my brother who is weaker and struggling with his soulish self. You know, things like that. So you, you can see such a paradigm shift. There's a change. Your whole life will be different. That's called practical Christianity. Yeah? Okay. So Martin Luther's advice is that the Ten Commandments are intended to help the heart to come to itself and to grow zealous in prayer. But he gave a caution. He said, take care, however, not to undertake all of this or so much that one becomes weary in spirit, which means that don't let even the prayer time, okay, becomes legalism, become a law. We say, oh, you know, I have to do this and then uh, become, uh, you know, this extra stress upon me. In fact, prayer should be like, you know, like the way I'm talking to my wife like that, you know. There's no stress, you see, because we communicate with one another, we love one another, and therefore it's easy to talk to one another. But if you always think that you have to, like every time when you come to pray, and like, like as though when you were, you were a student and you have to go and see the headmaster, the principal, huh? and then oh, I'm going to see the principal, oh, so very stressed out. So don't, don't, don't let it be that. Let it be a very, very wonderful, loving communication with God. Yeah? With practice, one can take the Ten Commandments on one day. So Martin Luther is saying that you can pray the Ten Commandments one day. <coughs> or you can pray a psalm on, on another day. That is to say maybe Psalm 23. You want to pray that psalm. Or a chapter of Holy Scripture the next day, maybe 1 Corinthians 13, and use them as flint and steel to kindle a flame in the heart. <coughs> uh, in, in his days, they used flint and steel, which means like, like the matchbox like that, you know, and strike the flame. So he say, use all this like you know, like you are taking a matchbox and strike a flame in your heart. So it's a very good advice, very good advice. All right, now I'm coming to the prayer proper. And so uh, we will learn. Now, all of you need to learn how to memorize the Ten Commandments. Uh, you know, uh, Brother Thomas is not here this morning, but, uh, you know, uh, he will be glad to, to teach you. And the rest of the brothers and sisters in this Zoom room, many of them know how to memorize the Ten Commandments, yeah? Uh, so if you don't know, we can teach you some other time. But right now, we just want to go through this uh, prayer. All right. Uh, the two portions that you, you, you take the Ten Commandments uh, from, I think most of you know, is Exodus 21 to 17 and Deuteronomy 5, 6 to 21. So these are the two portions. And the purpose of this prayer is to understand the heart of God. Right? You want to understand the heart of God and what He desires of you. Yeah? Okay. First commandment, uh, we say one God, all right? So those of you who are going to memorize, because one is one God, just one God like that, you see? So you raise out your fingers and say one God, yeah? Uh, but the whole thing is, uh, say, and God spoke all this word, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, who brought you out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. So that is one God, yeah? Yeah, you shall have no other gods except this one God. So Exodus 1, I mean, Exodus 20, 1 to 3. Now, how do you pray when you say about this one God? If you are here on Zoom or you are on Facebook, you can pray after me. Say, Lord God, Heavenly Father, you have commanded us to have no other gods. We praise you, precious Lord, for there is no one like you. We will worship you alone. We will trust only you. Keep us faithful to you alone. All right, so that's the prayer. Okay, that's a prayer. You want to say in Jesus' name, you can, but you don't have to say, 
because you are going to pray through the whole uh, list of uh, the commandments. Yeah. All right. Second commandment is no two gods. Okay. So you you just now is one God. Then now you say no two gods. Okay. No two gods. So uh, Exodus twenty verse four say you shall not make for yourself an image of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. So therefore, you know, uh, you know, I came from a pagan background. I came from a so-called Buddhist background, but actually not really Buddhist, but we are polytheists, which means that we worship many gods. You know, we Chinese worship many gods. And at one time, uh, I was the Kunyam uh, godson, you know. And so every time, uh, uh, every year, my grandma would bring me to the temple and during her so-called her birthday. Yeah. But later on, when I came to know the Lord God, then I no longer worship all these gods. Yeah. So, which means that all these I must put aside. All the idols I must destroy, I must put aside. Yeah. Because uh, the creator God, which is the greatest of all, he said that you shall not make for yourself an image of anything whether it's from the heaven or earth or in the water below. Okay, so all this out. So the first commandment is one God. The second commandment is no two gods. Very easy to remember. You see that number two, no two gods. Yeah, okay. So how do I pray? I, I pray, this is the prayer. Of course, you can use your own word, but this is just a guide, right? Say, Lord God Almighty, please help us to dethrone the idols in our life. Now, there are idols that may not be graven images, but there are idols like your boss, there are idols like your children. Did you know how many people, after we pray for them to have children, then they don't no longer come to church? Because why? Oh, I have my children now. I'm very busy with my children. Become idols. And some of it, the idols will be the job, you know. You say, look, pastor, pastor, pray for me to have a job. After I found a job already, Sunday, they want to come to church. Why? Oh, because Sunday, I have to follow the boss here. I have to follow the boss family for entertainment and all that. The, the boss doesn't need you to follow around, but you want to do so. And so suddenly, the boss and the job become the idol. So now you know that we can make idols of anything. Uh, I, I can tell you, uh, years ago when I was staying in uh, uh, Singapore, you know, then I, I saw one of my neighbors, he bought a uh, BMW uh, 3 Series, you know, it's a very small BMW. But every morning, every morning about 6 a.m., you know, I look down from my, my flat and I see him, oh, polishing his BMW, every morning polishing, polishing, I see him. Oh dear, now the, the BMW has become his idol, you know. So it was so precious, so precious. Imagine all these years. That was how many years ago? That was like 40, uh, 40 over years ago. And uh, now the BMW most probably is an antique already. So you say, God, please help us to dethrone the idols in our life and give us the grace to fear honor, love, and trust you above all things. Yeah? Above all things. Okay. Then third commandment is do not use the name of God in vain. So which means that you say, uh, okay, uh, you can see uh, on the screen here, means uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So three, you see? Three, right? And then you put this three to your mouth here. Put the mouth here. Means the third commandment is one, two, three, Father, Son, Holy Spirit to your mouth. Means do not use their name in vain, right? Means don't say Jesus or, or oh my God and all those. But sometimes we use the name of God in vain is that we, we pretend that this is from God. For example, in my church last time, there was a young man, you know, and he likes this girl. And so he went to this girl and he said, you know, um, um, God told me to marry you. <laughs> he, he used God's name, you see. You see, the truth that's called using the name of God in vain. God told me to marry you. And then uh, the girl said, but God never told me to marry you. <laughs> so, so the marriage did not happen. 
Okay. <laughs> so so uh, the, the actual verse is that you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Uh, the other thing is that I, I have also seen uh, ministers or pastors, evangelists, right, using the name of God in vain. Especially they use the name of God to get money. And they, they began to say, you know, at one time uh, there was uh, this uh, American evangelist, you know, and his house uh, got burned down. And so he began to go forth and plead with the people, you know, for the sake of, for the love of God, you know, can you uh, help me uh, to rebuild my house? And then, then the reporter, the secular reporters reported that he owns five houses. Not just one house. Not that he owned five houses. And a couple of them were in Malibu. And so if you know, Malibu is like our uh, KL, the Mon Monkiara. Means that if Pastor Albert owned a few houses in Monkiara, and one of the houses got burned down and asked you to donate for the love of God. <laughs> then you know that he's using the name of God in vain. And then finally, you know, this guy came out and then he said, oh, yeah, yeah, I have, uh, because he was exposed, you see. So he said, yeah, yeah, I, 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 have, I, I have a few houses, uh, but this is my favorite house that got burned down. <laughs> so... <laughs> You can see how manipulative our carnal self is, you know. So be very careful, uh, you know. Uh, don't be tricked by us who have titles like pastors or reverend and all that. We are still sinners saved by grace. And if we don't walk in the spirit, and then if we walk, you know, in the flesh, and that is in the soulish self, oh, some of the things we do can be, you know, like, like I say, the best of us will fail you. So please uh, look to the word of God and know the word of God. So do not use the name of God in, in vain. So here, uh, and you be very careful. Don't anyhow use the name of God. Okay. So how do you pray? We pray, gracious Father, your name is holy. Stop us from using it in unholy ways. May we always trust in the holy name of Jesus, our Lord, and use his name to bring honor to him and gain uh, victory for the kingdom of God. That is that in the name of Jesus, we can cast out evil spirit, we can heal the sick. Yeah, so that is not using the name of God in vain. That is using the name of God in the right way. Means for spiritual warfare. Okay, for spiritual warfare. Yeah. All right, fourth commandment is to keep the Sabbath day holy. And remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Sixth day you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the uh, Sabbath to uh, the Lord your God. Now, some people is, uh, they ask me that whether they should rest on a Saturday or on a Sunday. Uh, for us in Faith Line, is that we believe that uh, in the New Testament, uh, the Sabbath day uh, is moved on to become the Lord's day because uh, early church began to recognize the Lord's day. But if you feel that you are convicted to rest on a Saturday, go, go ahead. There's no issue. If you want to make uh, Saturday holy for, for you and you rest in the Lord and you attend your church on Saturday, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, we know that in certain parts of Malaysia, uh, some churches go to meet on Friday because their Friday is a holiday. Sunday is not a holiday. All right, It's not a day off. So they meet on Friday. So if you have to meet on Friday, go ahead. Uh, but the whole idea is to take that one day off. Yeah, one day off to spend that one day resting your your soul and your spirit and of course your body. Um, but some very sadly that some people they would take that day off and they will entertain themselves. You know, they go karaoke, they will go shopping mall but they will not come to church. Uh, but if you don't come to church, what happens is that the Bible admonishes us that we should you know, gather together and also uh, to have fellowship. 
and also to uh, receive the word of God and, and uh, be in the presence with brothers and, and our sisters in worship, you know, worship together. Uh, so we cannot depend upon, you know, the, all the Wi-Fi, I mean, all the technology whereby you say, I worship uh, with YouTube and all that. Uh, then slowly, slowly, you find that you'll be isolated. Uh, so, so even in Zoom, you know, we, we nothing is like you, you 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 eat together. Nothing is like you you talk face to face. Yeah. So uh, for us, is that on a Sunday is the Lord's Day, uh, that signifies the resurrection of the Lord, uh, which means that all the shadow of things in the past have been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So we no longer go back to the shadow. Uh, but we look upon Christ. And so we don't put a lot of emphasis on the past, uh, all these festivals and all that, because every fest festive occasion in the Bible points to Christ, right? Like the Passover lamb points to Christ. And so there are so many other uh, festive occasions and also rituals uh, in the Jewish faith, uh, but they all point to the Messiah. So since the Messiah has come, and therefore we put our whole focus upon the Messiah. For example, I was in uh, Maui, uh, uh, was doing this Haggai training for one month. And of course, I depended upon my uh, the photograph of my wife. You know, I look at her photograph when I think about her. Uh, but when I come back home, imagine if I come back home, I, I, I do not talk to her, but I look at the photograph and say, honey, I love you. Then she will say, you crazy or I, I'm here. And therefore we no longer go back to all this shadow of things or the images of things uh, to come because the savior is already here and the savior commune with us, you know, face to face. Yeah. All right. So how do we pray? We pray almighty God and father, you created six days in which to work and the seventh, you make a day of rest. Grant that we may use the Lord's day for rest in your presence and be refreshed by your word. So you can choose any day to, to rest. Uh, but if you are uh, very religious and you want to choose a Sabbath day that is uh, Saturday, then please go ahead. And then for those of us who choose the Lord's day, which is the first day of the week uh, to, to rest and to, to hear God's word, then uh, of course we have the freedom to do so. But choose a day that you can rest. Fifth commandment is honor your father and mother. And of course, this is the only commandment. So uh, this is the only commandment that has uh, attached with a promise. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so you say, honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Okay. So that is where uh, the attachment is. Mm. So. Uh, just now the commandment number four, I, I forgot to tell you, commandment number four would be, how do you remember? You remember every month you have like four Sundays, okay? So four, so so you will put four, all right? So when you think of what is commandment number four, you say, keep the Sabbath day holy, that's four, all right? Then uh, five is how, how do you remember honor your father and mother? You know, when you were young, you're very naughty and your mother slapped you, you know, so five, give you a five. But then you don't slap your mom back, right? You don't slap your dad back, right? You honor them, you bless them. So you put your fan there and say, I bless you. And therefore, commandment number five is honor your father and mother. So every time you see this, honor your father and mother. Okay. And then how do you pray? You say, great, gracious father in heaven, in your goodness, you have blessed us with our parents whom you want us to honor. Grant that by the help of your spirit or your Holy Spirit, that we may not provoke our parents to anger, but that we should love them, respect them, and obey them. So that will be our prayer. Okay, yeah. Mm, let's go on. Uh, commandment number six. Now, this is number six, right? In Malaysia, in Singapore, this is, uh, this is, number, this is five. The thumb is five, and then this is one. So five plus one equals six, yeah? So, you know, we when we go out and buy things, uh, we say, and you speak in Cantonese, Keda loya, lokmana, lokmana, okay, lokmana. So six, six, yeah? So commandment number six, 
also resemble like uh, the horn of the bull, the horn of the bull, right? So it, it can kill you, right? The, the horn of the bull can kill you. So you shall not kill. You shall not kill. See number six. Number five is <laughs> so honor your father and mother. Number six is what? Number six is uh, you know you shall not kill, which actually means uh, in Exodus uh, twenty thirteen say you shall not murder. So um, and 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 murder it doesn't mean that most of you you know you of course don't go and kill some people. I just read. Um, uh, Singapore news, I think. Uh, yeah, it's a Singapore news where a father-in-law uh, killed the son-in-law, you know, <laughs> over some dispute. Wow, I said, wow, this is serious, you know. Yeah, but you shall not kill. You know? No matter how angry you are, you shall not kill. But yet we do, we, we, we kill. Jesus said that if you hate your brother or your sister, uh, you know, you hate other people, you have already killed them. One member came to me and said, Pastor, I just hate the person who I never kill him. I say, but you don't understand, you see, that when you hate a person, what do you do? You kick the person out of your world. You understand? Which means that when I, if I hate you and you, you pass by me, I do not acknowledge you. I do not talk to you because you do not exist in my world. I already killed you in my world. You see? I don't talk to you. I hate you. So that's why Jesus said that if you hate somebody, it's murder. So ask yourself, how many people have you murdered? Sad, isn't it? Right? Have you murdered your mother-in-law, your father-in-law, <laughs> or, or your neighbor? Oh, that stupid neighbor, huh? He splashed water on my on my laundry. I hate her. I hate him. No. That's murder. Okay? Or you or you hate uh, some people of a different color. That's prejudice. Do you see? So be very careful because now we are we are disciples of Christ. We are children of God. We really got to be very careful. We cannot kill. And therefore, that's why, oh, by the way, did you know that if you if you are a Christian and you hate, if I come and lay hands on you, let's say you are sick, and if I come and lay hands on you, uh, you can't be healed. In all our 15 years of healing ministry, right, people who hate uh, very seldom got healed. Very soon. For example, one sister, you know, she in India. We were there. I think it's in Gujarat, I think. Yeah, we were there and then no, no, it's not in Gujarat. But anyway, we were there in the house and we began to she got this uh Bangalore. Yeah. Oh, it's uh yeah, I, I think that that's the place. Okay, so so what happened was that uh, the sister was having pain in her knee because she got arthritis. She's about 70 plus, I think. And she, so in order to heal her, we asked her to confess all her sin, right? Which means that all the people that she didn't like, you know, she confessed everybody, she forgive everybody. And so Pastor Grace proceeded to lay hands on her and commanded healing. You know, we don't pray for, for healing, we command that in the name of Jesus, we command, you know, uh, this arthritis to be gone. We command that every joint, every fiber, every nerve be healed in Jesus' name, you know. And she wasn't healed. Actually, healing of arthritis is very fast, very easy. Even my mom got healed, you know, when we lay hands on her. Now, why? So we, you know, ask her, you still hate anybody? She said, no, she forgive everybody. Then the Lord gave Pastor Grace a word. <laughs> and Pastor Grace told her, you hate yourself. And she began to cry. She said, yes, I hate myself. Wow. Why? And she explained. Because as an Indian woman, I must help in the house. 
But for these few years now, I have become an invalid because of this pain in my legs. And I, I cannot walk, I cannot work, I cannot help in the kitchen, I cannot do anything. I'm so angry with myself. Wow. See? So Pastor Grace and I asked her to forgive herself. <laughs> Actually, it's the teaching her the, the prayer, you know, hand over, hand over, just hand over, just hand over to God, right? And she prayed, she cried, and she prayed, and she cried. And then we commanded again, in the name of Jesus, we command this arthritis to go, we command her leg to be healed. And you know the answer. She stood up and she walked. See, that is very important. Okay? You cannot hate anybody, not even yourself. <laughs> All right? Uh, so, so good health will come to you. Keep, you know, believing God. All right? So you shall not murder. You shall not hate anybody. You shall not cut anybody from your world. Okay? So how do you pray? You say, Lord of life, thank you for giving life to all people. Grant that by your grace, we may respect the sanctity of life, including the life of the unborn. Now, here you see, we are talking about abortion. Now, if you have done abortion, then what you have to do is that you cannot allow that guilt to be upon you because I know some of you have been feeling guilty for so many years because you kill your own babies. No more. Because the Lord has set you free. Whom the sun set free is free indeed. The very moment you say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin. I was young and I, you know, I was selfish and I have done something wrong and I killed my own baby. Lord, forgive me. Immediately, you know what happened? The blood of Jesus is so powerful, it can forgive you even of this sin, all right, of abortion. Yeah. So don't carry that guilt anymore. You are set free. You are set free. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So I, I, I want you, you to know, right? Yeah, you're being set free. Uh, so if you have done this, just say, thank you, Jesus, for setting me free. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving my sin. Right? You can even say after me now. Yeah, just say that. And you find that that burden is no more. Because you hand over, even that mistake, you know, it's a big mistake, but you hand over. You hand over. Yeah. Yeah. We have we we, we have prayed for, for people, you know, who in the past they have committed a lot of adultery. They have uh, like one man told me, you know, one brother, he came in, he was gloriously saved, but he said, Pastor, you know, that time he was in his 50s, he said that, Pastor, you know, uh, before I was a Christian, you know. I think I've slept with more than 500 women. <laughs> so I said, huh? Wow, you are very active sexually. Huh? You know, and then of course, the Lord has forgiven him. Then I joke with him. I say, you are worse than the prostitute, isn't it? Uh, prostitutes are very smart. When people sleep with them, uh, they ask them to pay them. But you, you pay money to me. <laughs> but he, he was already set free. So nothing hurt him. You know? But so, Whatever sin, whatever sin, you know, even even actual murder, you will go and kill somebody, but God can forgive you, all right? And then, so you say, uh, Lord, you know, let me respect the sanctity of life and including the life of the unborn. Uh, uh, let us do nothing to hurt or harm our neighbor in any way, but rather to be of help, especially in times of need, okay? So that will be the prayer. Commandment number seven is like this, okay? Number seven is like this. Uh, can you see the seven here? So when you turn around, you say, your husband is not my husband. Your wife is not my wife. <laughs> so number seven is, you shall not commit adultery. All right? So the actual uh, verse is there. You shall not commit adultery. So uh, how do you pray? Merciful Father, you have established the state of marriage and continue to bless it. Give us grace to lead a chaste and pure life. Bless all who are married. Enable them to remain faithful to their vow and to be patient and forgiving. Now, if you have a divorce or if you 
uh, you know, previously you have been staying with somebody, you know, without marriage. And if you have resolved all this, like for example, of course, when you are divorced and you are remarried, then stay faithful to this marriage, okay? All the past have been forgiven. Yeah, don't let the past kind of plague you. Don't let the, you know, the legalism of some people, you know, some people, when they see people who have been remarried and they will come with a condemning uh, notion, you know, and say, you're condemned. No, the Lord set you free. The Lord set you free. Okay, you are free. You are free because you have asked God to forgive you. And then uh, those of you who are living with somebody, you know, it's best that you get married uh, legally and, of course, before the Lord. Uh, but don't jump from partner to partner. That is not the way of the Lord. And that's not the way, you know, that will be healthy to you. Okay? Yeah. And so if you are of the, if you are involved in same-sex uh, uh, relationship, this is time for you to cut. All right? You, you, you have to break. There's no such thing as half-half, you know? Because... Uh, that would be the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and so uh, that one you find that you really have to break. Yeah. Um, let me explain. A, a lot of, you see that the devil bring in confusion by, by doing this. You know, it's not that men are not uh, interested in men. Okay. Now, men, we are, like I'm, I'm good friends with many men. But you see, God created what we call brotherhood. You see, we are brothers like Jonathan and David. They're so close. They're brothers. But some, you know, some of the gay movements say, that, ah, you see, they are having, you know, you don't have to have sex, uh, you know, having good relationship, right? Uh, some of you brothers are my good friends. You see? So there is a relationship where it's a platonic relationship. It's a brotherly, sisterly relationship. So if you are very close with a sister, it doesn't mean that you're going to have sex with the person. You can be sisters, you, you see. So so the devil is always taking the sex, you know. Remember the five relationships that I, I, I taught you? The first relationship is between leaders and follower, means between employer and employee. So that's the first relationship. First relationship, you, you can't have sex. But nowadays, employer employee have sex, right? Because that is what the devil turned the, the, the thing of God upside down. The, the, the second relationship is what? Husband and wife. Yeah. Husband and wife, yes. This is the only relationship that you can have this marital bliss of having sex. Yeah. Then the third relationship is parents and children. Parents and children. No sex involved here. But yet you, you find it in the West and I think even here. Incest happened. Father, you know, raping the, the daughter. And then you, you, you read about a mother sleeping with son. What, what is going on here? That is the devil plan. You, you understand? Anything of God, he reverses it. So if you are involved in this, repent. And all this will be in the past. Ah, and then you have brothers and sisters. Also, you cannot have sex. But yet you find, yeah, siblings having sex. Huh? How come? Once again, I tell you, the devil is hard at work. And you will be foolish to submit yourself to the devil. You are not going to bring happiness to you. There will be joy. There will be that momentary, you know, that, that moment of lust. But lust can't give you eternal joy. Isn't it? So lust will continue to create that lastful hunger in you and then you will just spin you know in fact you will spiral into a, a point of uh, you know uh, spiritual darkness yeah and then the, the the last one the fifth relationship is friend with friends how many friends having sex with friends yeah a lot not married and just and some of them for fun of it all right i mean you have read enough on the internet but these five relationships God has created them for you. Now, there's a sixth one which is even worse. is bestiality, right? It means a human being having sex with animals. Now, where all these things come from? The Lord tells you, 
the Luciferian spirit, Lucifer, has come. Satan has come and take over your life, okay, and mess it up. And so what is of God is good is all turned to bad. And so now you, you see that the people outside there is telling you that, you know, all this uh, uh, same-sex marriage is good. And then if the church is against it, then the church is bad. So black become white, white become black. All right? Good become bad and bad become good. You see, so we are the offender. But what we are trying to say here is that it's not because that we are prejudiced, but these are sacred institution created by God. Because some people compare, right? You, you compare and say that, you know, uh, why you're not prejudiced against skin color, but you are prejudiced against uh, different uh, sexual, uh, you know, uh, uh, involvement. The skin color cannot be prejudiced against because it's sacred. God make them that way. The marriage inst institution is sacred. God make it that way. But anything that is different from what has God made, then we say it's wrong. All right? So do you endorse, like, for example, there's now in America, there is a Twitter file. He's trying to get the court to approve that he was born that way. He said, I was born that way. Therefore, I must have sex with children. A fetal foul. In the Bible, we call that sin. Okay? Same-sex marriage, sin. As clear as day, sin. That's it. But you see, when people have partake of the fruits of the tree of good and evil, what is happening? Then they define what is sin. So this is not sin, that is not sin, you know, stealing is not sin, you know, cheating is not sin, a man having a lot of concubines, not, 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 not sin, all these are not sin. It's sin. If I have sin, what must I do? I must confess my sin, I must repent of my sin. No point confessing and don't re repent. All right. So if I'm stealing from the company, you know, I'm stealing pen, I'm stealing paper, I'm stealing stapler, I'm stealing all the stationery and give to my children. Do you think that's sin? Of course. It's called stealing. So I confess, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm, uh, I, I, I've been stealing from my boss. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Then next day, I go and take back the stapler. I go and take back a, another whole bunch from the office. So do you call that repentant? That's of course not repentant. So you see, it's very important for you to learn uh, through the commandment, you will learn which area of your life need to be changed. Uh, so, commandment number eight, just now we talk about, right? You shall not steal. And so, how do you pray? You say, Almighty God, uh, you are the giver and preserver of all good things. Help us to value honest work as your gift and the means by which you bless our effort. Help us to always respect others and never to steal from them. Now, how do you remember commandment number eight? Remember, this is eight here. All right, this is eight. Okay, I'm showing you eight, right? Eight. Okay. Uh, you see the two zero from the eight, right? And then you make it into a handcuff like that. Handcuff. So if you steal, you'll be arrested. See, eight. And this is how you remember. Commandment number eight will be stealing. Thou shalt not steal. Huh? You shall not steal. Okay. Now we come to number nine. You shall not lie. You shall not lie. All right? Number nine. So how do you remember number nine? Okay, this is nine, right? Means that four wrong, don't say five. Four wrong, don't say five. Means that people make four mistakes, don't tell the judge five. Okay? All right? If you go to court, uh -huh. so four wrong, don't say five. And so... Those of uh, you know, those of you who, <laughs> who are involved in gossip, right? And then you hear one little juicy piece of story. Okay. Let's say, for example, you you see uh, a male and female coming out of the hotel. 
and this one is your friend. And then you go and tell your friend. So I saw John and Mary in the hotel. And John and Mary, they are not husband and wife. They are colleagues, right? And they came out of the hotel front entrance. And then you add on, must be doing something wrong. See? Means four wrong, don't say five. But the truth of the matter is that this man and this woman have gone to the hotel on the company uh, purpose is to book a lecture room, book a conference hall for their company. And so they were at the front desk and then later on they met with the manager and then they booked the place. And then they came out of the hotel and went off back to work. But because you assume that somebody come out of the hotel must be doing something wrong, therefore you add on must be doing something wrong. And so what happened is that immediately you have committed, you have broken commandment number nine. All right? Because commandment number nine is you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Because what you don't know, you cannot make assumption. And then when you tell this story to another person, then the other person add on the story and say that must be committing adultery. And then another person will add on and say, yes, they book room to go upstairs. You know, and then suddenly these two person, innocent people, were being, you know, <laughs> falsely accused. And imagine if the man has a family and the wife heard about it, then there's a divorce. Then this is what, what happened here because you do not acknowledge commandment number nine. Therefore, be very careful. Don't open your mouth and talk something that you don't know. Okay. So what you have to do, what you have to pray is say, Lord God Almighty, help us to be loyal to our neighbors. That means that people around us can be our colleagues, our friends, and do nothing to damage their reputation. Always guard their reputation. Okay? Always guard their reputation. And be very careful. I, 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 I heard of some people who came to me, you know, and he wanted to tarnish somebody's reputation. Then he the person will ask me a question. Let's say, for example, uh, okay, uh, come to me and say, Pastor, why do you think John and Mary, uh, they go to the hotel? No, how do I know? Uh? But the purpose is to drop that hint, you see, and say that, you know, John and Mary, they have gone to that uh, hotel and they are not husband and wife. So be very careful because God knows when you are walking in the soulish, God knows your intention your motive and, 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 and how desperately wicked is the heart of men and women. All right? And so if, if your purpose is to tarnish somebody's reputation, stop it straight away. In the name of Jesus, stop that. Because that is the temptation of the devil. It causes you to sin with your mouth. And then you, you, you see, you say, it means that do nothing to damage their reputation. Make us more ready to forgive than to judge. Now, if they really have done something wrong, then we want to forgive instead of judge and always speak the truth than to lie about them. Okay. And, and the danger here is that some of us, we know that it's a lie. We know that it's a lie. But it's repeated by somebody. Somebody tell you, but you knew it's a lie, but you refuse to correct it because you don't like the person. So you say, let the lie spread. You see? Then who is in the wrong view? The Lord will hold you accountable because since you know the truth, why didn't you block it and say, no, I know this person. He's not like that. Okay? See? So, so this is <laughs> this is the commandment number nine. Yeah? Uh, so four wrong, don't stay five. So there's nine. Okay? Mm. Okay. We come to the ten commandment you shall not covet. So you shall not cover it after your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, anything that belongs to your neighbors, anything, your neighbor's servant, your neighbor's uh, uh, cow, your neighbor's donkey, your neighbor's uh, Mercedes-Benz, your neighbor's BMW, your neighbor's uh, villa, you shall not cover it. So how do you remember commandment number 10? It's this way, you put out your hand like that and, and say, I want, I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. I want, I want, I want. <laughs> Means I want 
So number 10 is 10, right? 10, uh, 5, 5, 10. You shall not cover. Okay? Now, this uh, covetousness is, is, is like this. We buy things that we don't like to impress <laughs> people that we don't like. Somebody said that on the internet, yeah? So how do we pray? We pray, gracious God and Father, please enable us to be good stewards of all your gifts, content with what you, you have given us, and eager to advance the cause of others, even if it is, it is to our disadvantage. Give us a generous heart and joy in serving our neighbor. So here you find that the prayer and everything that we are doing is to bless others and even to our disadvantage. Yeah. So then when after you have prayed through the uh, Ten Commandments, then you have a concluding prayer. Okay. This is how you pray. And I pray all this for the glory of the one true God. Of course, you can say in your own words, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that is Trinity. And also for the full unity of God's people. Now, when you start to walk this way, you find that there'll be a lot of love, a lot of forgiveness, and there'll be unity. Jesus said that he wants to see us united and not cursing one another. And then, and for the extension of God's kingdom. So his kingdom can be spread throughout the world by our love that they will know, all right, that they will know that we are disciples of Christ and they want to be disciples of Christ too. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. So that is how we uh, do our Ten Commandments uh, prayer.